So tonight's topic is top 20 Central Texas native plants for birds. I know many of you are native plant lovers and many of you are bird lovers and most of us are both. Uh, Judy Green is, is a popular speaker uh, here in the San Antonio area. And she's been an urban wildlife biologist uh, for many years, uh, many of them here in San Antonio. And uh, she's frequently reminded that she helped co-found the first chapter of Master Naturalists here in San Antonio. So uh, we appreciate Judith joining us tonight. And Judith, if you can take over. Yes, sir. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining me today. Um, so um, I am in San Antonio. I'm one of two urban wildlife biologists, and this is my contact information. Should you have any questions, feel free to take a screenshot. I will have my information up again at the very end um, as well. Um, I do want to just make a quick note of um, uh, one website. I am also part of Texas Children in Nature. And one of the things that we have done um, for our collaborative is to here in the San Antonio Central Texas area is um, offer a website that's kind of a one stop shopping for uh, residents of Texas as well as visitors uh, to our area. So if you um, are interested in something in particular that may be going on, a lot of our partner organizations and agencies post a lot of their events, their classes, workshops, um, their sites. Um, on nature rocks, san Antonio.org, so that we can get our families back into nature. So just make a note of that. So make sure to visit that site and see what may be going on any given week if you're looking for something to do outside or um, to just connect to nature. So tonight's talk is going to be talk is going to be about the top 20 countdown for plants for birds in Central Texas, and it will cover um, the majority of the plants that I'm highlighting cover the four eco regions here in the surrounding Bear County area. So the plants for the most part will cover Edwards Plateau, which is kind of um, Central Texas, um, also a little bit east of there, the Blackland Prairies and um, the uh, Post Oak Savanna, as well as South Texas Plains. So there are four eco regions that are being covered and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that here in a minute. Um, but um, I just wanted to let you know that um, when we're talking about the plants, if you have any particular questions, um, hopefully I can address those when we're, we're covering that aspect. So for those of you who are not avid birders, a lot of people, um, when I talk to various audiences, I, I quickly realize that they don't realize how many birds we have, not only here in the United States, but also in Texas. So um, normally I ask everyone to kind of shout out how many they think are here, but since of course we're in a different venue tonight, I'll just go ahead and, and tell you. Um, but most people typically think there are way more birds than there really are, but in the United States, different species of birds. But in the United States, we're looking at about a little over 1100. If we're talking only about the lower 48, um, just really about 950. But the amazing thing to me is that if you live in Texas, we've got about a little over 620 species of birds that either migrate or reside here year round. So um, what I'd like to emphasize is that what you do on your property can make a huge difference. And of course, we also know that a lot of our birds are on the decline, their populations. And typically speaking, most birds, when they nest, if they nest here in Texas or anywhere in the United States, they typically return to the same area to nest. Um, their, their fledglings typically will return to the same location. Um, and so it's important that they have habitat available to them when they return, especially if they are migratory species. And so so um, again, oftentimes because of development, that habitat is lost. And typically speaking, um, when they are coming back to where they originally were either born or where they nested the previous year, this sometimes is what replaces what was once habitat for them. So this is what they're seeing oftentimes and in most urban areas, especially. And, and it's not even large cities anymore, even smaller rural communities oftentimes 
are emulating what we see in our larger cities where we have these neighborhoods, oftentimes gated or ungated, it doesn't matter, but ultimately habitat is typically removed during development. And then the, the developer and or the builder uh, typically just leaves dirt intact. And so neighbors uh, that um, exist there, they typically will put in turf grass when new um, neighbors buy a home and um, move in, they look around and they see everybody else putting in the turf grass. So they kind of emulate the same thing. And that's, of course, what many of us, especially if we've grown up in the city, that's what we're used to. So we kind of just do the same old, same old every time we move to a new location. And unfortunately, um, what this means is, is that we just don't have a good habitat available for a lot of our, our birds as well as other wildlife too. And so um, in the state of Texas, um, now this is an old uh, census. So we've got the new census coming out probably shortly. And I suspect um, the new census will show that we have close to 30 million people probably in the state of Texas, half of which live in the top three cities in the state being Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston and San Antonio. So again, keep in mind, half of Texans live in those top three cities. And as you can see on this particular um, slide, you see the state of Texas dotted heavily on the eastern half of the map. And um, that just means that there are a lot of urbanized areas um, in the eastern half of the state, as well as in the panhandle. Um, and so, you know, it it is a little bit daunting to think that, you know, a lot of that valuable wildlife habitat, bird habitat is lost. However, the thing that I'd like to remind people is that we do have the power to manage our, our own urban lots. And typically, you know, it's not something that could be as overwhelming as most people think. And I hope tonight to show you that it can be a very simplified way of putting a little bit back of what was once there. Um, so keep that in mind. And it is crucial. This is really a call to action. I, um, I hope that those of you that are, are joining me tonight will share this information with others that you know, especially if they're not familiar with um, you know, putting in habitat. It's going to be simple, I'm hoping, uh, by the time we're done with my program tonight. I hope I empower you to feel like you can make a, a change um, on your properties. So typically birds need diversity. If you love birds, you know, the, the beauty of birds is they have no boundary limitations. They can fly in, fly out without any issue. And so what we do in our backyards, what we do on our small plots, even if it's large acreage, um, it can make a huge difference if we're doing the good things. Um, first and foremost, I typically tell people who own larger acreage um, to always leave the plants intact. Don't go in and clear out a, a piece of property, especially if you've just acquired it. I oftentimes tell people to stay or, or to um, uh, go onto their property over the course of maybe three to five years before they really start clearing anything if they feel they even need to at some point. Um, because you want to get to know what's there. You may have a ton of valuable plants that are wonderful bird plants and you just aren't familiar with them. And so going onto your property and identifying, taking pictures of the, the plants that are either in bloom or that are fruiting throughout the different seasons, that's just you getting to know your property. And that also applies even in urban situations. Sometimes, um, you know, we have things that grow um, in, in the backyard. Maybe there's a little section of green space that still is there, a little um, island of, of canopy with things growing underneath it. Don't be too quick to remove what's growing there. And also on the other note, um, if you have any kind of property, um, sometimes just doing nothing on the property and letting things grow up because there is uh, seed sources in the soil and oftentimes with natural rainfall that we have, yes, we occasionally have that here in Texas, um, oftentimes that will allow those, those plants to grow up and then you can then identify what it is that you may have growing. In some cases, of course, you know, if it's something that would be invasive, um, you can look at texasinvasives.org to make sure it's not um, something that you wouldn't want to keep because again, we don't want to prop allow these invasives to propagate themselves out into our natural areas. So those would be something you would need to address and remove. But, um, you know, again, it's, it's, um, it can be something as easy as just using some resources that I'll be mentioning here in a short bit um, about how to identify what you have growing on your property. But as you can see from this image here, especially, there are a lot of different layers to habitat 
Um, most of us in urban areas, especially, we have a lot of canopy. So we have a lot of large trees, but what's really missing is the mid-story layer, the understory layer, and even ground cover. For most of us, again, ground cover consists of turf grass, and that's not really valuable in, in the least bit for, for any wildlife, really, um, and especially not for birds. So unless you have diverse ground cover, you know, that may also be something that needs to be enhanced, but we want to add that layering, if you will. This is really what we're kind of looking for when we're talking about um, you know, adding that diversity. In this picture, you can see there are a ton of different kinds of plants. Um, in the background, you can see there are some canopy trees. It's nice and thick, almost like a little woodland back there. Again, what that is, is that layering, that vertical layering. So you have large canopies, you have some shrubs, maybe some ornamental trees growing underneath some of those canopy trees. Um, and then in the foreground, you see a lot of wildflowers, and some of those are uh, just small growing shrubs, in addition to wildflowers such as uh, forbs, soft bodied plants. And, uh, you know, these wildflowers oftentimes can offer seed as a food source for birds. But the other thing to keep in mind is that they also bring in pollinators. And pollinators really are crucial. If we're wanting to attract any kind of wildlife species, we have to have pollinators and we have to. Um, uh, try to draw them into our landscapes because pollinators, um, you know, many of them are also on the decline. And oftentimes it's, again, due to loss of habitat, but also chemical use in a lot of our landscapes. Um, so their populations are dwindling. And pollinators, um, they obviously pollinate the plants. They pollinate the landscapes that we love throughout Texas, the nation, throughout the world. Um, even they, pop, they populate and, and pollinate the, the plants that we eat. Every third bite, you can thank uh, a pollinator for that. But they also serve as a valuable food source, especially for, for birds. Um, caterpillars in particular are, are something that 96% of birds during the breeding season rely on heavily uh, to feed their young. So um, if we don't allow those insects to be present in our gardens and on our properties, then we're really doing a disservice to the birds that we're really trying to attract and, and all the other wildlife for that matter. So of course, there are a ton of different types of birds that we have throughout the state of Texas. Many of them are beautiful birds. Um, I'm not going to get into um, bird ID per se, but again, you know, there, it is important and I, I will uh, share a resource um, that will allow you to help with some of the bird ID because you do wanna kind of know what kinds of birds you're attracting. Um, anytime you're managing a piece of property, whether it's an urban lot or even a larger lot of acreage, um, Having a baseline, knowing what you, what kinds of plants you have currently growing on your property is important. Um, and also knowing what kinds of visitors you have to your property in the form of wildlife is important. And if you're doing good things, then typically speaking, you'll see an increase in the different kinds of birds and other wildlife that you have visiting your property. So um, that is one reason to note what it is, what you have coming to your property. So let's get into um, what it is that birds need to survive. And I will tell you, I'm trying to, for, for those of you who are not plant people, because um, oftentimes when I, well, when I first got started, I really didn't know my plants very well. And it took me years to get to know a lot of my plants. Um, but for simplicity's sake, um, there is a simple formula. And typically I tell people, focus on native plants, number one, um, if native plants to your region or eco region, and then add a water component. Because the native plants that you're planting um, will provide, they'll provide food, they'll provide the shelter um, to get out of harm's way from a bird of prey or to get out of uh, inclement weather. And then adding that nesting site component is crucial too for them um, as they're of course rearing their young, having that safety of, of being able to do that. Um, and then when you add that water component, really, that's kind of the equation. Um, I will tell you though, if you're not really good with your plants, um, don't fret. Instead, focus on how does that plant provide a food source? And that oftentimes can be a little bit easier to discern versus figuring out what plant you know, offers what animal good shelter or nesting opportunities. And so if you're looking at a, a native plant for your eco region and you know that it's a good bloomer, or that it offers really good fruit of some kind. And that can be a seed, it can be a, you know, an actual fruit, a plum, berry, it can be any kind of fruit that that plant produces. Um, if you know that it offers either of those two items, um, then typically speaking, that's a great food source. 
But the other thing I want to add in there, and this is something that I realized just recently after listening to Doug Talome, um, Nature's Best Hope. He's the author of that book. Um, and I would encourage you to even look him up and listen to some of his talks as well. But I learned something uh, very recently that I didn't realize was that, um, and I kind of alluded to it earlier, that 96% of our birds uh, rely on caterpillars as a food source. Um, for a, a family of chickadees to raise their brood, um, they might eat well over 9,000 caterpillars, or they may feed their young over 9,000 caterpillars in a particular uh, nest rearing session. So that's a lot of caterpillars that these birds have to find throughout our yard and or maybe the neighbor's yard or within our subdivision. So if you have a lot of those plants and, and especially plants that are larval host plants and what a larval host plant is, is it's just a particular plant that uh, a particular butterfly or moth may use to lay its eggs on. And then subsequently those eggs will emerge and the caterpillar comes out and then feeds on that plant. So yes, when you plant a larval host plant, I, it does eventually lose some of its leaves. So you do have to be tolerant of that in order for all this to work. But the beauty is, is you now are adding a yet another food component to your garden if you have larval host plants. And I will uh, share with you that the plants that we're gonna be looking at here shortly um, are mostly larval host plants. So they do all offer potentially caterpillars um, at some given point for birds to feed on, to raise their young and for their own benefit. So again, focus on the food. Does it offer a bloom? Does it offer a fruit of some kind throughout the different seasons? And is it a larval host plant? Because that's a bonus. That means it's producing caterpillars that birds get to feed on. So um, I've kind of alluded to this uh, just a second ago, but I just wanna emphasize it again. Make sure that you're providing different plants that offer either food, shelter, or nesting opportunities throughout the different seasons. And ultimately, um, you know, uh, what was I gonna say? Um, I just lost my train of thought, sorry about that. Um, goodness, I just lost my train of thought. Uh, well, anyway, different, essentially, the, oh, the different seasons, essentially, um, goodness, I just went blank. I guess that's part of, um, <laughs> aging a little bit. Um, but um, bottom line, you know, um, I, I highlighted food, but oh, I know what I wanted to say. I'm sorry. Um, when we are putting plants in because they attract the, um, because we're putting them as a food source, what I typically also tell people is not to worry so much when that plant matures. That's typically when we'll see um, whether or not it's a good uh, nesting opportunity or whether it is a good um, shelter source for some of the birds that we're trying to attract. That's all I really wanted to say. And then, um, so if you have a lot of native plants on your property, that is really the ideal situation. In some cases, when you're getting started, if you don't have a lot of plants on your property because it's mainly turf grass and you're in the process of converting potentially, or you, know, you just really don't have much in a way of, of good habitat, um, you can put out feeders. Um, so essentially you're putting supplemental food out. Um, the only downside to that is you are inviting birds to one location. If you think about it, if a bird is visiting your garden and they're in, it's visiting a shrub on your, on your property and it's just inundated with berries. Well, a bird comes along, uh, lands on a limb, eats the one berry and then flies off. Well, the chances of another bird um, coming to that exact location and maybe possibly picking up some type of parasite or even a virus that was uh, from the sick bird that visited it before is pretty slim because again, the fruit's missing. So the chance of that bird going to that exact location is, is probably not likely. However, when you have a feeder of any kind, you are again, inviting them to one location. So you need to make sure that they are kept clean. Typically speaking, if you have a lot of visitors, I would say have multiple feeders that you can trade out. Make sure that um, if you're providing anything um, in the feeder, I like black oil sunflower seed. That tends to be the one of the, the favored um, seed sources for most birds. Um, make sure that that is kept dry as well. And if you notice that it's gotten wet, then remove it so that you're not providing a food source that could be detrimental to any visitors. Um, adding water 
um, is something that can be very simple. Uh, bird bath is typically the, the most common way that people will provide a water source to birds. And I don't know if any of you have experienced it this year, for some reason, we have had a high number of cedar wax wings visiting properties. And um, out at Government Canyon, they had like, I think three to 400 cedar wax wings um, over at the headquarters where they had a bird bath and they were having to refill their bird bath almost by the hour because there were like 50 to 100 cedar wax wings trying to all inundate this one water source. So um, again, water is, is a, a component that they have to have. If you provide it in your backyard or on your property, whether it's a permanent pond like you see in the image on the right, um, or whether you're putting saucers throughout your garden, um, then you, know, you just wanna make sure that um, they are kept clean um, and something on the right there, if it's more of a permanent pond, then typically over time, it will ecologically balance itself out. Typically birds will bring in um, possibly fish eggs. And so you'll have uh, possibly some small gambusia or mosquito fish um, eventually that will help with the mosquito control. Um, they'll feed on the mosquito larva that might wind up in your pond. If you have a recirculating uh, water source, then of course that also helps that more or less um, makes movement on the water and, and therefore mosquitoes typically cannot lay their eggs on moving water. Um, it's typically on stagnant water that they lay their, their eggs on in. So um, here you also see these water sources, you know, have them under canopy uh, to offer the water um, source in a manner such that if the bird is visiting this water source, they can fly up into the tree limbs um, to get away from a bird of prey or to get away from any other uh, predator that might be in the area, especially for uh, feral cats, house cats sometimes that are allowed outdoors. They of course sometimes sneak up to these water sources because they, they definitely know that birds visit. So they come in and um, oftentimes check these areas out. So you wanna keep your birds safe. I will say, you see um, obviously a turtle here in this one water source, um, you know, having it out in the open when you have shallow sa saucers like this can actually heat up in Texas. So you wanna make sure to keep these water sources in shade so that the water stays cool and it doesn't overheat. And of course, water safety is also very important. Um, you wanna make sure if you have a really deep bird bath or a deep water source, um, go ahead and add a rock, um, especially one that's a little bit more sh um, slanted and flat that still is maybe partly submersed, but also partly above water so that a bird can have easy access to that water source. And you also wanna keep in mind that if an animal um, that's visiting your water source, whether it's a bird or or mammal for that matter, um, if it falls in to a deep water source, like maybe a trough or um, uh, a, a water recycling or a catchment, like you see here, water catchment, um, that they can get out as well. Um, so in the upper right, you can see a, an escape ramp. And those are really great for troughs out in um, rural areas, but if you happen to have one in your backyard, you can use these as well. And they're made of a mesh. So anything that falls in, it doesn't matter how low the water source is in the trough, ultimately an animal can get out. And in some cases, I just recently learned this, some people actually use these escape ramps even on the outside of the water source to allow easier access for some animals to get in, especially mammals and, um, and um, I guess mainly man mammals, and I don't know that amphibians, but maybe even amphibians could use that ramp to get into the water source and get out um, easily. So that's something to consider. And in the water catchment that you see on the bottom, uh, they just added some cinder blocks. I would add a nice accent rock on top of those cinder blocks, again, slightly submerged so an animal can easily get access to the water and also uh, leave the water easily. Um, I kind of alluded to this earlier, but um, you know, I tell people to live with the vegetation that they have on their property for a long time. Um, again, three years minimum, because it's hard to learn what you have in one year, in one, one um, in four seasons. So ultimately, if you at least um, keep the, the plants that you have in your property for, for three years, maybe even five, it may take you that long to learn everything depending on how big your property is. That's important because a lot of times I've had people come up to me and, and they see me at a booth or at an event, they see my shirt with my logo on it and they're like, wow, I'm so glad you're here. Um, I love birds and I wanna know what I can do. We just um, inherited or bought property and we cleared it this weekend and now I wanna know what I can do to, to help birds. And I'm like, oh my God, my heart just breaks when I hear that. 
because they have just destroyed probably, I mean, and they've created more work for themselves in the long run because they now have removed probably a lot of valuable habitat um, that could be, could have been very beneficial to birds, not to mention other wildlife. Um, if you don't have a lot of plants, um, you know, there are some birds that do utilize um, cavities uh, during nesting. If you don't have old or dying trees like the snag on the left, um, typically I tell people to cut any overhanging limbs, especially if this is in a backyard scenario. <clears throat> you don't want to have overhanging limbs fall on you. So, you know, to make that safe, keep the trunk and then cut overhanging limbs down. Um, but if it's out in a more natural space, you can leave it as is. Um, but if you don't have dead or dying trees on your property, then go ahead and put up a nest box. Um, as you can see here, um, I think you can see my cursor if I move it. There are three arrows. And really, um, the one thing that I will emphasize um, is that, you know, you want to have uh, ventilation, especially here in Texas, if you're going to be putting up a nest box, you want to have the ventilation at the top um, where the roof line is. You can drill holes there if you want to, or you can just have a gap like they show in this particular image on the right. Um, and then you also want to have holes in the base or on the floor of your nest box as well. And, and that is in case any rain, if any rain winds up in the nest box that it will have a means of getting out so that the babies and young are not um, drowned. And then of course you can see here on the, on the right you have, um, it's kind of like a, um, an extra piece of uh, wood and what that does is um, it creates um, a little bit more of a thickness so that raccoons can't um, sit on top and put their hands in there. So it, it you know, if, if, if I'm a raccoon it's harder for me to kind of reach around and reach in there and get my hand in the hole and down into the actual bottom of the nest box to get to any young to feed on them. Um, and or it stops squirrels also from excavating the opening and making it larger so that they sometimes take over the nest box. Um, but again, if you have a nest box that has a little pole underneath the hole, remove it because all that does oftentimes is allow something like the house sparrow to perch on that and harass any native birds that are possibly using that nest box. So successful bird gardening, um, you know, and ideally you want to um, offer, again, I'm just going to summarize real quick, you want to offer a variety. Um, having those native plant species, especially larval host plants is so important. Um, having plant height, um, adding that diversity, that vertical diversity that we talked about, um, and then having food year round. Um, and then adding that water source at different depths even, whether it's a, a pond that you install or whether it's a bird bath, it doesn't matter. But birds typically don't like things deeper than three inches if you're gonna be providing a bird bath. So you may have to add a little bit of pebbles or something if it's really, really deep and or add that, um, that um, escape ramp. And as far as layers, again, most of us have canopy, adding understory and adding ground cover is so crucial if you wanna add uh, habitat for birds and, and bring them in to your property. So <clears throat> I kind of um, talked about this earlier as well about the ecoregions, but I just wanted to show you a map. Um, again, the ecoregions is crucial um, to knowing um, where you live if you want to be successful in, with the plants that you incorporate on your property. So when you're looking at native plant lists, um, you do need to kind of know what what ecoregion you live in. If you live in the Edwards Plateau, which is number seven on this particular map, um, it pretty much is shallow soil. You probably will hit rock very quickly. Four inch pots are an amazing thing to find. So if you're putting in plants um, in your garden or on your property, um, that really helps with not having to dig deep holes when you're dealing with a lot of rock that you're hitting. Um, number four is um, Blackland Prairie. And there, again, the only thing to keep in mind is you don't wanna bring in or introduce other plants from other areas because it's black clay soil. Um, and so that will hold a lot of moisture and a lot of uh, after heavy rains. So you could eventually or could potentially um, drown any plants that aren't used to having their feet wet for long periods of time. So um, when we do have rainfall. So again, plants that are appropriate for black land type of soil is really what you should be planting there. 
And then we do have um, number three, which is post oak savanna. Um, there you have sandy soils. Um, and typically post oak is one of the indicator species of um, living in post oak savanna. They're very common there. And then we have a little bit of South Texas Plains, which is number six down there. And there you have a lot of thorny scrub like uh, properties, sandy to loamy type soil there. So again, just knowing what ecoregion you live in can be helpful. And I will tell you, um, this is just, these are some resources that I usually recommend. Um, I would encourage you to take a screenshot uh, very quickly here. Um, but I love Native Texas Plants by Sally Wasowski. It's this one right here, the, I guess the second one in, if you will, the large one. And I love her because this particular second edition has a map very similar to the ecoregions that I just showed you. So it's very easy, user-friendly to use. You just kind of, it's like catalog shop. And you go flip through her book. If you see something you like, um, if you know that you're hill country and it's, I think in her book, number eight, you'd look under range of that particular plant. If there's an eight, you know that that plant will do well in your soil type. So again, very user-friendly and easy to use. I will say the Texas Wildscapes book, this is the second edition that I have Im the image of here. Um, <clears throat> It came, it came with a CD, but unfortunately with the new software, if you've got um, Windows 10, um, then unfortunately that software no longer works. And um, I don't know if our book will be updated with a new CD um, in the future, but um, the first edition therefore would probably be the one that you would want to try and find because it has the complete plant list in the actual book. So I would look for that in maybe secondhand stores or online. But again, there are a lot of great field guides um, if you're trying to identify your plants, but um, this one in particular, I wanted to mention management recommendations for native insect pollinators in Texas. It's an online PDF, very easy read. Um, and um, it's, it's in, uh, intended to um, provide landowners, small or big, with information on how to attract pollinators and what you can do to benefit pollinators. And keep that in mind, that's a major food source for a lot of our birds. So if we're wanting to attract birds, we wanna make sure that we are offering pollinators a food source as well, because like I said, they are also on the decline. And they of course are responsible for the landscapes that we see and um, for pollinating them. And, um, and these plants are, are, are again, valuable um, uh, pollen source and nectar source for our pollinators. And um, of course, these plants also provide oxygen for us. So we rely on them for the very breath that we take. So it is important um, that the 30 million people in Texas, um, you know, maybe take a small action to gardening for birds and or pollinators or both. Um, so that we definitely um, have a future for future generations like our kids and our grandkids so that they're not um, having to deal with um, issues 50 years down the road. So as far as online gardening resources, I will tell you as far as plant lists, I love Lady Bird Johnson's Wildflower Center's uh, plant list. Um, if you check that website out, um, it is, of course, they're located in Austin, so they primarily focus on um, um, our Texas plants, and, um, and um, it is also one that you can um, provide information so you can get a plant list that's appropriate for your needs. So it is interactive, so to speak. Same thing with the Audubon website, um, audubon.org, Plants for Birds. Also uh, a very interactive uh, plant uh, informative database. You can add your zip code and come up with a list for plants for your backyard. Um, Cornell Lab of Ornithology is a way to identify birds. I, I mentioned that. Um, you can download their Merlin app um, and use it on your phone as well. And you can hear calls and, and it helps you identify any birds that you may have coming to your property. And of course, the Native Plant Society also has really good plant lists for different parts of the state on their website. And they also have a, a plant certification program um, uh, or excuse me, um, Yes, it is a, it's a certification program for individuals who want to learn more about native plants. So again, keep that in mind. Um, the iNaturalist app, um, before we start getting to the countdown of our plants, I just wanted to mention that as well because it really is a great way for you to set up a project for your property. And um, it's very easy, you do need to download the, or set up your account probably on your computer and then use the iNaturalist app on your phone to actually use that as the tool to identify what you have on your property. And that is for both plants and for wildlife. So if you can get good pictures of birds, um, you can get help with online um, 
uh, professionals and individuals who are in that community who love to identify pictures. And so they can help you identify what you have as well as help to confirm um, your sightings for your particular project. So keep that in mind. The one thing I will say is you don't wanna set, when you, you can set your iNaturalist um, to, um, uh, so that it's, it can either show where you took the picture or it can kind of hide where you took the picture to a certain degree. Um, you don't wanna make your sightings completely private because if you're trying to get help with identification, oftentimes it is important for those who are looking online and trying to help you to kind of know roughly where you are in the state. So um, it, to identify a plant or to identify a, a bird or any other animal that you may be posting for your project, for your, for your property, um, you definitely wanna be able to allow them to know that you're in either East Texas, South Texas, Central Texas, wherever it is that you're, you're occurring so they can help you uh, identify that, that picture. So we're gonna go ahead and get going with our countdown. So um, just FYI, um, you know, I, I looked up these plants um, using Wasowski's book, Sally Wasowski, that I mentioned earlier, um, Lady Bird Johnson's Wildflower Research Center as well. And so, um, you know, these are, are plants that I feel are not only relatively accessible in the nursery trade, but they are also highly prized by wildlife. Um, and I also used our Texas Wildscapes book to also highlight um, which species in particular um, feed on these particular plants. So, um, I will tell you that um, Tex Turk's cap, even though it's number 20, it's really one of my favorites. Um, it is a larval host plant and keep that in mind. That's what LHP stands for, by the way, when you're looking at these different slides, I'm trying to highlight that it is, and it does offer um, a food source in the form of a caterpillar too. So it offers great fruit from August to September. Um, it has these um, red, kind of cherry like they taste like cucumber people can eat them too but not all plants um, should be eaten by the way I just want to make sure we note that um, there are some plants that can be eaten but if you don't know which ones are which don't eat anything just because a bird eats it does not mean that you can eat it some of these can be highly poisonous um, to, to people and not so to birds but um, it does offer a cucumber like fruit and it's typically eaten before you ever see it. And of course it is a great nectar source for our hummingbirds as well. So um, hummingbirds and butterflies alike. It is almost evergreen and it is a shade plant. And so therefore it is one that you can almost put in, in relatively deep shade. It sometimes may straggle a little bit and the growth habit may look like it's struggling and it may not put out as many blooms in deep, deep shade. But again, it can tolerate shade as well as as full sun. My number 19 plants, let's see. Okay, my number 19 plant here is um, the um, ash juniper. And a lot of you are probably thinking, why on earth is she showing a cedar? Um, so of course it's primarily in the hill country. Um, it can occur in blackland prairies um, and it, ooh. Um, sometimes it can encroach in black lion prairies as well. Um, but cedar is really important because of the fact that it is an evergreen. And if it's in an urban area, a large mature cedar will drink just as much as a large live oak. So with that in mind, and you know, we want to have that diversity. And unfortunately during development, a lot of times developers come in and they leave all the live oaks and they remove everything else. So you have just a stand of live oaks. And the problem there is, is if you wind up having something like oak wilt, uh, come into a neighborhood or a part of the city or a part of a community, um, then ultimately you can wind up losing all those mature trees and it can take years to, to wind up getting new trees to, to replace those. So that's why it's so important to have diversity on your property. Um, so again, if you have a, like, if you have like four or five, 20 acres of just a stand of ash juniper or cedar, um, then typically that's not a, a, a good um, uh, means of keeping it intact. That's not what I'm encouraging you to do. However, if you're in an urban area and you have 
uh, an ash juniper on your property, you know, don't feel like you need to remove it because again, they drink just as much as a live oak drinks um, out of our aquifer. So, but they both offer diversity and they offer different means of um, shelter for our, our birds, especially in the winter months. We don't have a lot of evergreens and juniper fits that bill. And now with ash junipers, there is a male and a female. And you can see here, uh, the female offers these fruits that are cone-like. Uh, uh, it looks like it's a berry-like cone um, and they feed on that during the winter months when they're migrating through. So a lot of our cedar wax wings that were coming through, we're looking for female um, fruit. Um, and um, of course, uh, I will tell you, there's you can remove males if you want to. I mean, I would definitely encourage you during the winter months, if you do need to remove some ash juniper, then make sure that you keep somehow mark the females so that they do not get removed. And if you need to remove some, then remove the males. There's typically enough pollen floating around, as most of you will contest if you wind up having um, cedar fever. Um, that um, your, your females will still be pollinated and they'll still be producing fruit. But of course, very important for our golden cheek warbler, which is our resident Texas, well, it's not our resident Texas, but it is our, our one bird that is on the threatened list, that endangered list, excuse me, that is um, also uh, born here in Texas. So it's a Texas native. Um, number 18, um, this is one of my favorites as well. It is American Beautyberry. And I love this plant um, because again, it's a shade loving plant. So it tolerates a lot of shade. It has a beautiful fruit on it. So it's very ornamental. Unfortunately, it does, I guess, have chemicals in it that does not oftentimes allow for um, a larval host plant or a, a plant, uh, excuse me, for butterflies and moths to, to easily access, access this as a larval host plant. So it, it, I could not find anything that uses this as a larval host plant. However, as you can see here, it really does bring in a lot of different birds from mockingbirds, cardinals, thrashers, robins, uh, warblers, even bobwhite quail utilize it. So again, has a lot of value for the fruit that it offers uh, during typically kind of the fall and winter month time frame. And then um, number 16 is grama. So there are a lot of native grasses. Um, a, Cytos grama, of course, is one that it's the Texas um, state grass, and it does offer these wonderful seeds that you see here in this image on the left. Um, and a lot of different birds utilize those seeds as a food source. And of course, they use the grass as nesting material as well. And that's typically true of most of our uh, clump grasses. And these typically, of course, are found in blackland prairies, but they do grow. This one in particular can easily grow throughout most of the state. So you will see it in, on most of the eco regions. And it is a larval host plant for, of course, our skippers. So that's another bonus. Here's another grass. I'm not going into a lot of them, but I, I just wanted to show you uh, a different one. The side oats grama grows to about four feet in height. Um, this one is probably a lot taller, closer to like six feet in height, um, but very ornamental as well. Um, and this is big blue stem and also even little blue stem is another one um, that's a wonderful um, native grass. But big blue stem feeds many birds, at least 24 species that utilize it um, as a food source. And of course it provides good cover and nesting opportunities. Um, well, nesting material, I should say. And it too is a larval host plant. Most of our native clump grasses are larval host plants um, for some type of butterfly or moth. So again, um, in some cases it's, um, uh, in either case, both moths and butterflies will be producing caterpillars that birds can feed on. Number 14 is Mexican plum. This one is one that oftentimes gets um, planted in full sun, but most people don't realize that it's an, a great understory plant. In East Texas, um, where it occurs also, typically it grows underneath canopy trees. So you can, it does tolerate um, part shade. Um, again, great for songbirds and game birds because of the fruit that it offers. And it's beautiful. It offers white blooms typically early in the spring um, and is also a larval host plant. So again, producing those caterpillars for our birds to, to feed on during the springtime um, when um, they're looking to, to raise their young. Number 13 is Maximilian sunflower. Um, this is a good food source in the fall because it offers the fruit in the fall. Um, but of course, it's a great nectaring source for a lot of our pollinators. And keep that in mind, every plant I'm showing you typically offers a, a flower. So these are also great plants for our pollinators. So they have to feed on the pollen and the nectar, uh, depending on the species of insect that is um, coming to that, that particular bloom. But um, 
uh, they also serve as a source of food for our birds. Um, and this one also is a larval host plant um, for the bordered patch butterfly. Number 12 is agarita. Agarita is one that I love because of the fact that it's an evergreen. Um, it also is kind of an understory plant, so it will tolerate shade for sure. Um, it typically blooms very early on in the year. Um, I want to say, I believe, um, late, early March, in March. Um, so I believe is when it typically can throw out blooms. And so you have fruit early on as well. Now it is a very thorny shrub. So uh, you do want to be cautious as to where you plant it. You don't want to plant three together because it's hard if you've got things growing up in the middle of them to get to them to, to um, remove any unwanted plants that may grow in the middle and, and gain access. Now this fruit oftentimes, of course, is also very beneficial for um, making wines and jellies. So we can eat this readily. Um, gaining access to the fruit is a little bit more difficult. You want to wait until the fruit is, is um, ripe. And then typically most people put a sheet underneath a uh, shrub and then just hit the shrub itself with a stick. And so that the berries fall onto the sheet and then you just kind of collect your fruit that way. That's the easiest way. Otherwise you wind up with um, injured fingers because you literally will poke your fingers and they, I mean, to the point of bleeding. So it can be a really tough plant to collect the fruit off directly. Um, number 11 is Texas ash. And it's one that um, is the larval host plant for the Eastern tiger swallowtail. It's very fast growing. Um, and again, offers some really great nesting and cover opportunities for a variety of different birds, um, but also um, there's a, a fruit that um, our finches and cardinals and grosbeaks love, um, primarily in the fall. Um, number 10 is Virginia creeper. And um, this one is one that um, actually has a very uh, highly poisonous fruit for people. So, you know, again, keep that in mind when you're planting plants. Um, you know, again, every once in a while, you'll come across a plant that could be detrimental to um, possibly a pet. If you have, if you know that you have a pet, for instance, that eats a lot of things on the ground, you might want to make sure that maybe this is one that you don't incorporate. Um, but most dogs, thankfully, don't typically just eat fruit off the ground. Um, they're going after the good, you know, good stuff. Like, you know, they're going after the barbecue pit or something that, something that's, um, you know, that, that, that's more smelly um, and enticing. But um, do keep that in mind. And of course, you know, if you have little ones, um, you wanna make sure that they aren't picking things up ever and putting things in their mouth. And that applies no matter where they go. So um, if you have really young ones um, that may not be able to discern, you know, okay, don't eat this, um, then you need to keep your eye on them so that they don't wind up taking something and putting it in their mouth. Um, but this is a larval host plant for the Sphinx moth. It does have fall color. So that's one of my reasons that I absolutely love it. Um, number nine is possum haw. And it is deciduous um, in, the, in the winter month. Um, so typically that's when you see the fruit, like in this image here on the left. You can typically see it just is covered in the fruit. It's gorgeous. It's just an, essentially a naked shrub with all these beautiful red fruits all over it. Um, and of course, it, it feeds um, bluebirds or robins doves um, because it's typically fruiting um, through the winter months from September through February. Um, that's typically when a lot of our migrants um, take advantage of this particular shrub and feeding on it. Um, there is a male and female version of this. So um, I bought one a while back when I moved into my current house. And unfortunately, I have not seen fruit one. So I have a feeling I may need to venture out. I, I assume that either I may have a female, I'm assuming that I have a female and I just need to go out and get a male so that I can potentially get some fruit on the plant that I have out there. Because I, I, I do see flowers on it. So I'm, I'm believing that I have a female. But it is a larval host plant of Henry's elfin butterfly. So again, offering those wonderful caterpillars. And this is, happens to be a cedar waxwing getting some of its young there. So cedar waxwings were gorgeous this year, um, especially being able to see them so in, in such high numbers. Um, my number eight is a cedar elm tree. This one is a well-behaved uh, tree that typically you can plant um, pretty close to a building, uh, thankfully. I mean, it has a very straight up growth habit. Um, 
And so, but it does kind of have a lollipop head. So you don't want it too close to a building. I mean, I typically don't like to have large trees too close to any home. Um, however, um, it is relatively fast growing. And, um, and so, you know, it's one to incorporate it, of course, feeds a variety of different birds, as you can see here, um, typically in the fall um, timeframe. And of course it draws in a lot of insects. So ultimately birds are benefiting from all the insects that are visiting these trees. Most canopy trees um, are a good substrate for insectivorous birds. Um, and then of course it does offer fall color, which is kind of a yellow, um, but you know, here in Texas, we don't get a lot of fall color plants. So it is kind of important to note when we do have them. And it is also a larval host plant. So once again, offering those caterpillars for our birds. And then number seven is Texas persimmon. Um, it's one that is a very slow growing uh, shrub or small tree. Um, it's beautiful. It, it has a bark very similar to crepe myrtles, which most of you may be familiar with. And it's a larval host plant as well. So again, offering those caterpillars. Um, and then um, it does primarily provide its fruit during the summer months. So again, having those different seasons offer food, um, this would be a good one to have on your property for those summer months um, for the different songbirds and game birds that, that may be in or on your property. Uh, number six is chili bean, and it's one of my favorites as far as, um, um, it's also again, another good shade plant. So if you have a woodland, I do have, a, I'm um, on a third of an acre and thankfully uh, the builder who built our house left a lot of the canopy trees intact um, and also understory too. So um, I added some of these plants in um, the mix to just bring in more birds and chili bikin is one that I have seen a lot of my birds visiting. Um, it has a bloom as well as a fruit almost at the same time on the plant. And um, again, it produces pretty much almost all year well most of the year, April through December. So um, it's one that you can also readily eat. And as the name implies, it is chile, which means spicy hot. So you can use it for cooking purposes as well. My number five, um, this one, um, again, I'm mentioning the plateau live oak tree, but however, any oak tree for that matter, depending on what um, eco region you're in, are very, very beneficial. Oaks in general are probably the number one tree that provide an enormous amount of caterpillars for mo from moths and butterflies for birds. So um, there are too many larval host plants to almost mention, but typically speaking, your skippers, your hair streaks, even the Arizona sisters as one butterfly that uses it as a larval host plant. Um, it is typically almost evergreen. Right now they're shedding in my yard a lot of the leaves. They kind of rotate out their leaves. So it's never naked any given time. It's like new leaves are coming on and then the old leaves are falling off at the same time. And pretty soon here we'll be having, you'll be noticing a lot of that yellow pollen from our oaks here in the area in, in the San Antonio area at least. But again, another great substrate for insectivorous birds. It provides great nesting opportunities and cover. Um, and of course the fruit, which are acorns, are produced typically September through October and a lot of different birds um, love to feed on them as well as other wildlife too. And then flame leaf sumac, again, is another one that I absolutely love. It's my number four pick. Um, it provides a lot of different fall and winter um, fruit. It feeds at least 21 different birds. It does offer fall color. Um, I believe this one doesn't, is not necessarily a larval host plant. I did not find anything um, uh, relating to that. But again, it offers really just that beautiful understory that birds oftentimes will utilize too um, when it has its leaves still on. My number three pick. Now this one is an interesting one because if you have this one, you'll notice when it blooms that it has a foul smell. It kind of has... Um, if you have cats, it kind of smells like a, a really <laughs> bad kitty litter box. Um, it, it has a, kind of a, a urine type of smell to it. And the amazing thing is, is that the pollinators that are drawn to this particular flower are flies primarily. So they're the ones who do most of the pollinating for this particular uh, plant. But the fruit um, produces, um, that it produces draws in at least 40 species of different birds, including um, turkey, woodpeckers, bobwhites, doves, and several songbirds. Um, it is deciduous, um, so it doesn't keep its leaves year round, but again, it's really a beautiful 
um, I guess you could call it a very large shrub. It's actually really a tree almost, um, but uh, they can get huge. So they, they can get about, I would say 20 to, to about 20 feet tall for sure. So it can be multi-trunked as you see in the picture on the bottom left, but the smell of course is what's interesting. And you know, if you really are observant, you'll see a lot of flies all over it when it's in bloom. Um, so they're not great smelling flowers. So I don't know that I, if you open your windows, I don't know that I would have this one right outside of your living room or bedroom or wherever it is you open your windows if you ever do here in Texas. Um, you, know, you can have that one towards the, the back part of your property, but again, be amazed at all the, the flies that will be on it. Um, and of course it's serves a lot of bird, birds um, for the food source that it provides through the fruit. And again, that's also a summer fruit, fruiting plant, which is again, a rarity a lot. There's oftentimes the summer is the hardest time to find blooms or fruiting uh, plants. So when you find one, you definitely want to try to incorporate it. My number two pick is wax myrtle. Um, it, bro it blooms also in the summer months. Again, like I said, that's a time frame when um, it's hard to have um, and find plants that offer something in that way. And um, it provides food for 40 different species of birds. Uh, again, cedar wax wings typically use it. Now, wax myrtle is another one of those plants where there's a male and female uh, plant. So um, depending on um, you know, where you're acquiring your plant, if you're gonna be planting it or getting it from a nursery, you wanna make sure that you're getting a female version versus a male version. And, um, and uh, let's see, it is evergreen and of course a larval host plant. So um, now I'm going to tell you my number one pick and normally in a room, I usually ask everybody, um, but hopefully you might've guessed it. One that most people think is a trash tree. So I'm giving you a hint. However, it is far from a trash tree. And I don't even like that term um, because every tree has value. Every plant has value to something. So um, my number one pick is hackberry tree. And if you've ever been to any fence line, you can see that birds are planting them repeatedly for us because on any given fence line, you typically will have a ton of different hackberries growing. So this in of itself tells you that birds love this plant and they're replanting it for us because of course they're eating the, the, the fruit, it goes through their system. And then of course, when they're perched on a fence line, it passes through their system onto the ground and then they're planting these wonderful plants for us. So. And of course, it's a food source that is valued by cedar waxwings, thrashers, cardinals, bluebirds, um, and again, is um, a great substrate for insectivorous birds and is also a larval host plant to the hackberry butterfly. So um, it is one that also provides that caterpillar uh, food source in addition to everything. So with that, let's get flying. No perching around. I want everybody to get active and keep in mind too that you know um, San Antonio has just recently acquired the, the status of being a bird city. If you feel like your community could benefit from becoming a bird city, um, you know, if you belong to an organization that would like to pursue that, um, check out Audubon Texas and Texas Parks and Wildlife's websites um, to see whether or not it might be something that your community can um, participate in and get certified in. So with that, um, let's go for any questions that there might be. Thank you, Judith. That was tremendous. Just the picture of that painted bunting was... <laughs> That's great. Um, By the way, just FYI, um, for those of you that may not realize it, um, Government Canyon, if you're within close proximity, we do have painted buntings out there every year. So um, if you want to see some painted buntings, go out to Government Canyon State Natural Area, which is on the northwest side of San Antonio. Well, again, that was terrific. Um, several people wondered what happened to, to plant number 17. I think, I think you skipped over it. Hmm. How about that? Let me see. Just a... There Evergreen sumac. Oh, okay. That's another one that um, definitely, again, a larval host plant. I like it because it's evergreen. Um, it does take some shade, part shade. Um, and again, it feeds mini birds. And these actually um, can be eaten by people as well. And they are tart. Um, but this one is really one that... Um, uh, like I said, tolerate some shade. So you can have it in the shade or full sun. Rachel Sawinski asks, how do people submit events to be listed on Nature Rocks? 
Um, typically, uh, you just need to, um, well, if you are part of the collaborative, um, like for the San Antonio area, Thea Platz is our coordinator. And so um, I would encourage you, if your organization doesn't belong to our Texas Children in Nature group, um, to make sure that you um, get added to the list and, um, and we can work, walk you through um, getting your information on naturerocks.org. It's not, it's not something that I can easily explain right now. So it does take a little bit of effort, but it's, it's not too complicated once you know how, but it's, it's, it's a little bit harder to explain right now, but definitely get in touch with Thea Platz um, and or me, and I can, I can get you linked in. So if you don't know Thea. Rachel also asks, are you recommending using iNaturalist obscure setting? Yes, you can use the obscure setting. Thank you for that, Rachel. Um, so there is a public, obscure, and private. So the obscure setting, if you don't want people to know exactly where it is that you live or that you, you know, if you want to have a little bit of privacy, then the obscure setting allows you, affords you that. So therefore, um, they won't know exactly where it is, but it'll kind of give them the general location of where the picture came from. So therefore, that will help them ID what species you might be um, having, which you have in the picture. Private setting, they won't be able to see at all where, where the image was taken. So therefore, they won't know if you, if you took it in West Texas, East Texas. So it, for some species of plants and or animals, it could be more difficult to identify if they don't, if people who are kind of experts in that field and are wanting to identify the image for them to actually identify it accurately. Okay, Irene Hansen asks, what about Eastern cedar as a bird plant? Eastern cedar. Um, so I think if I'm not mistaken, um, well, it depends on where you live. Um, I'm not sure, I, gosh, Eastern cedar, I'm not sure. So Eastern cedar sounds more like a common name and that's the thing you have to be careful about. When, and that's why I mentioned ash juniper, although most of us do note it as a cedar. Um, there is another type of cedar, I think that is East Texas. Um, do you happen to know? Right, but is that North Texas or East Texas? It's that's what I thought. It's East Texas. I've got my lifeline over here. Um, uh, but um, so if you live in East Texas, then that would be appropriate. But if you're trying to bring it into the Central Texas area, I would refrain from doing that. Um, again, the ash juniper that I, I highlighted. Most people are not going to be able to find that plant, um, and most people would think you're crazy if they actually, um, if you asked to acquire it from their property, but um, it is, like I said, a beneficial plant to have. So if you have no ash juniper on your property and you want to plant one, and you, you can dig one out, a small baby one from a, you know, a, a, removal, a removal project, um, then by all means, you know, it wouldn't hurt to, to do that, to add some uh, diversity to your land or to your backyard even. But I mentioned it because I want people to be aware that in urban situations, especially where most of the ash juniper has been removed, everybody has such a negative connotation towards ash juniper um, that they typically want it all gone. And that's really in an urban situation when you lack diversity, you want to keep that diversity. So um, that's where I would encourage you to, to keep an ash juniper that's established in an urban setting. Okay, Nancy Masterson asks, does Fantex green ash have the same benefits as Texas ash? What was the name of it? Fantex green ash. I'm not hmm, familiar. I'm not, I'm not familiar with that one. I will also tell you, um, if you're wanting to know if something is native to Texas, um, the uh, wildflower.org website, the Lady Bird Johnson website that I highlighted, um, in the program. If you type in the name under the, their database, if it doesn't come up, that's a good indication that it may not be native. Um, and I also want to mention they do have plants for all of the United States. Now granted, because they're housed here in Texas, they have a more extensive list probably for Texas. And that's one of the reasons I love them so much, um, that website as a database. Um, but also keep in mind that um, uh, they may list that plant and they may show that it comes from a different state. So when you're relocating plants from other states, the soils can be different. And of course the rainfall 
um, is going to be different. So that particular plant may require more water, whereas here in Texas, we're very drought, so it may not work as well. Uh, Becky Bertoni asks a quick one, is rough leaf dogwood sun or shade? Um, that one can be either. So it can be in full sun, it can be in part shade. Um, it can also be in shadier conditions. So it's an understory plant, so both. I see a general question from Sandy Wheeler. What is a good shrub for shade area? Okay, well, um, shrub, again, it depends on what height that you want. Um, we mentioned Turk's cap. That's, a, that's one that gets about four feet to five feet tall. Um, uh, Carl, help me out. I need my lifeline here. Um, what's the plant that we have in the back corner here? The, is that Barbados cherry? Yeah. So Barbados cherry is one that I have growing in uh, shade conditions in my backyard. Um, and um, it, I believe also is a male female, right? Isn't it? Or, okay, I don't remember now if that's a male or female because I don't see a lot of fruit on it, but it does um, uh, put out. Mountain laurel is another one. We tend to plant it out in full sun conditions, but it also will tolerate shade. Um, I will say that um, if you are interested in finding more shade plants, I do have a shade plant list that um, actually my husband created when he was a master naturalist way back when. So if you want to email me, I can send that to you via PDF. So uh, just email me directly on my email here and just ask for shade plant list and I can send that to you. Does wax myrtle require extra irrigation? No, not, well, um, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, to get established, I would say yes. Um, and that's any native plant, you know, you want to kind of baby them initially, but once, um, you know, we're kind of on the Western range of wax myrtle, um, it typically is more of an East Texas plant, um, but it can survive. I mean, I've seen it at SeaWorld um, and it was thriving, which is on the West side of San Antonio. So I've seen it as far as, as that. So I would say just initially, yes, but again, you want to plant it in, um, in soils, I would, I guess it actually, wax myrtle, let me see. It's primarily South Texas and post oak savanna. It fares best, but I've, I've um, seen it over in SeaWorld and I wanna say that's probably, they probably have, I don't know if that's South Texas Plains soil type over there or if it's Edward, a little bit of Edwards Plateau, but in kind of an urban setting, you probably could have a good chance of it growing well. Well, thank you guys again. Thank you so much for spending the evening with me. I appreciate it. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to, to email me um, and I'll, I'll get those plant lists to you. And I definitely, before um, I sign out, I just wanted to encourage all of those that are still on to look at joining their native plant societies um, and also their Audubon societies. Um, these are really great resources to learn more about birds and also the native habitat that, that these birds rely on.